We cannot discuss the small arms of the Great War without an in-depth look at the machine guns, and among them one design was far wider in use than any other. Hi, I'm Othias, and this, oh good lord, this is a German Maschinengewehr 08, the MG08, a beautiful World War I era Maxim machine gun. Now let's get it over the light box. Shorter than some of the rifles we've seen, this gun is only 44 inches long, but weighs in empty of ammo and water and without a mount at 40 pounds. As we'll see, this is the lightened version of this gun. The weight goes up almost 80 pounds with the addition of the sled mount, although it does carry most of the accessories for the gun as well. It was generally fed from a 250 round cloth belt, although 500 round versions were available for aircraft. Those belts feed the 7.92 by 57 millimeter cartridge Spitzer bullet. All right, gang, big gun, big episode. I'm sure you can see the time code by now, so you have one advantage on me. Now, this is one episode of two, and it's going to get a little confusing if you're used to our usual format, because I'm going to have to change things up. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the MG08 and then the gun we're covering next time out of Russia are both towards the end of the maximum development cycle. So I want you to be prepared that if you're just here for the shooting segments, they're gonna come much later than you're used to, so start scanning from back to front. Uh, that's because there's a lot of development history with a lot of big names, big personalities, and the biggest of all, Sir Hiram Stevens Maxim. Oldest of what would become eight children, Hiram was born in February of 1840 near the village of Sangerville, Maine. A child prodigy of sorts, he was known as a dedicated student and extremely hardworking. In his youth, he would journeyman out to various skilled trades, giving him a broad engineering base early on. It's a common story to hear that young Hiram Maxim, working a grist mill, designed his own mouse trap that was capable of resetting itself thanks to winding up. But he would go a step further, removing the spring power in favor of having the first trapped mouse, likely panicked in its captivity, reset the trap for the next mouse to be caught. What perfect foreshadowing for the man that was going to take otherwise ignored forces and turn them into the whole principle behind an auto-loading, uh, well, firearm in this case. Many different iterations thereof. Now, he was not the only inventor in the family. His father had the bug. And there's actually an invention of his that would lead to the development much later in his life of this gun here. And that was really a chain-fired, hand-crank, rapid-fire gun. Now this is not that gun, obviously. That design was lost to time, and we only have Hiram's word for it, but this much later patent by someone else covers the core idea that we're worried about. Linked steel cylinders with priming caps, preloaded powder and ball fed through the action. Now Hiram would claim that his father's gun was never really patented. There may have been some paper copy that is lost. And then supposedly he made a wood model uh, just sort of proof of concept, but that also has been lost to time. He did say, though, that that gun used a sort of jointed arm, like we're used to, as you'll see in this gun, although I don't know if it provided the locking principle or not, because we're going to see Hiram go through several locking principles despite using roughly the same idea for each of them. Anyway, back to the man who is still in his youth. Hiram continued working odd jobs from farming to wood turning until the outbreak of the American Civil War. He did not enjoy the prospect of being a soldier and so avoided enlistment. Coincidentally, he spent some years living in Canada. He promises these are unrelated. There, he quarreled with a local school board over his invention of blackboard paint. Now, at the time, the U.S. would not draft three brothers of the same family, and so once two of his were sucked up by the machine, well, he was safe to return home, which he coincidentally did again, not because he was avoiding the war or anything. These things just timed out that way. Now, post-Civil uh, War, Hiram would try to look into his father's inventions in terms of firearms one more time. And as part of this, he would actually journey down to Savannah, Georgia, where he spent some time target practicing with some former rebels, and in the process, apparently received a fairly good bruise and noticed sort of the gush of energy coming out of the front of the muzzle that was moving the grass and blah. We've heard this before from Browning. Uh, you just happen to notice that there's a lot of extra things that are going into this rifle that are causing effects on the outside environment. Something to keep note of that it's probably wasted energy. Again, believable from a man who had a mouse-powered mousetrap. So uh, at this point, he didn't really do anything with his idea. He just had that 
inkling in his head because Hiram wasn't a firearms man first and foremost. He was really an inventor of everything. He just kept studying, drafting, chemistry, electricity. He designed carburetors, light bulbs, the methods to make the filament for those bulbs, current regulators, and more. He would eventually found the Maxim Gas Machine Company, and profits were good. He became a wealthy man of note. Now, I'm going to go very simple on what is a complex history. Many of you know that the years leading up to the widespread adoption of electric lighting were chaotic to say the least. By now, I think it's fairly understood how vicious and aggressive both Edison and Westinghouse could be in their feud. We also have something akin to folk heroes coming out of the same period, like Nikola Tesla. It was a messy, rivalrous, and down and out patent race at that time. What we don't often hear about, however, is that the comparatively quiet Hiram Stevens Maxim was beating many of these men to the punch. So much so that his own partners would push him to the side. In 1878, he had joined forces with Edward Weston and Moses Farmer, the latter of which was a very early innovator in electricity. They formed the United States Electric Lighting Company, which would later become a subsidiary of Westinghouse. Also, just an odd note, one of the vice presidents would be Marcellus Hartley. What a small world. So this is kind of interesting because there's not a clear example of why this happened, but in my mind, best guess, there's some vanity here and some elbowing. Like, electricity is the big new thing. Hiram Stevens Maxim is very skilled at it, but he's not necessarily a front man. Uh, not in the way that we see, like, Edison and Westinghouse going at it. So, it looks like for his part, his company says, look, we don't need you here stirring the pot. We want you to go over to Europe and make sure we're not missing anything. So, they pay him 20000 a year on a 10-year agreement. That is extremely high pay for the time in order to go to France and make his way through as many patents as possible. And he did. And then once he did that, actually very well with lots of comments and notes sending them back to the US to see if there's any room for innovation, he then went over to the London office where he was meant to clean things up because it was running kind of erratically. Now, in London, he got bored. Uh, he's no longer in the, at the front, the forefront of this inventing technology. He's not as good administratively as he is in terms of just figuring out the solutions to problems. And so he's kind of listless. And he's talking to his friend. They're lamenting over this. And his friend is saying, look, it's nasty because with electricity, I mean, you guys have seen the ACDC wars and all this other stuff. There's a lot of red tape that's starting to form around these uh, sort of inventions. Like people are getting electrocuted at poles and governments are stepping in or not stepping in. There's all these arguments around it. And so he needed to look at an industry that was less regulated, where he could be more free to invent and be even more careless than ever. I met an American Jew whom I had known in the States. He said, hang your chemistry and electricity. If you want to make a pile of money, invent something that will enable these Europeans to cut each other's throats with greater facility. Now, if any of you are a bit worried that he identified the religion of the man, I can't help you, it's a direct quote. So if you don't like it, you'll have to take it up with Hiram, not me. So by 1883, we're seeing patents show up from him for semi-automatic rifles, blowback operated rifles, very simple things. But he's experimenting, right? He's getting back into the flow of firearms and he's getting ready to rediscover some old ideas he had. But first, he surveyed the field because remember, the quote was, you should find a more efficient firearm, a, a more deadly firearm, a uh, militarized firearm. This isn't just tinkering. He has an idea to sort of slot into this growing field of rapid fire, lighter than artillery, bigger than a rifle fire, okay? And so for that, he starts looking at the comparable guns already around. The infamous Gatling gun, the Hotchkiss revolving cannon, the Nordenfeldt organ, and the often twin-barreled Gardner gun. Just a note, all of those have been animated by VBBSMYT over at his YouTube channel, and we do license our machine gun animations from him so that Bruno doesn't have to have a fainting spell. So if you want to see what Maxim was working against, go take a look, it's fascinating. Now, back to him, Maxim saw what you're seeing now and had several concerns with the designs. One, they all depended on human muscle power to cycle. Two, they were massively heavy. Three, they were slow. Part of this was dealing with the possibility of hang fire, so you had to rotate at a rate that would allow for the slowest reacting cartridge. And four, gravity feed magazines exposed the loaders to enemy fire. Maxim would gather some business investors to the tune of 10,000 British pounds to help develop his machine gun ideas. Step one in fixing all of this was to finally cash in on that recoil idea he had had all those years ago. He developed a patent around a Winchester lever action with a spring-loaded butt. This was not going to be a production firearm, but rather a means to lock up the rights to recoil operation. 
Now, Hiram worked this up in stages. He didn't just go out like John Browning and just design an entire system. He crept up on it. So first concern is, can I get the recoil action to work? So he sets up a, a barrel and a sort of breach, and he wants to see how much power it really takes to get it moving. And as part of that, you know, he finds the usual problems that we now understand very well, which is that too little power and it doesn't cycle, and too much and you blow out the primers and have other problems. So that was very... I mean, that's really educational. We take it for granted that we understand that now when we're tuning a, a gun that has spring problems or something, but back then, I mean, that's new. So once he's done with that, he sort of sets it aside or scraps it, that device is missing, and he comes up with a second device. Now this one, again, I don't have drawings on this, but he says that it managed to feed multiple rounds. Now whether they're by belt or just a little gravity feed, I can't be certain, but he lines, he sets the whole thing up, and he's just doing a basic test just to kind of see how far he'll get. And he puts like five rounds in a tray and then he hits the trigger and they're all gone before he can blink. Like just, he was, he didn't even have time to understand that all of the, like he, he thought something had gone wrong. No, it had just shot them all. They were all gone before he could even process what had happened. And at that moment he knew that he was going to have a success. Like in his mind from his own memoirs, that's it. I got it now. It's all detail work from here. Following those two, he developed this in 1883, nicknamed the Forerunner, likely the world's first true machine gun. Forerunner used two star-shaped spindles to feed ammunition from a cloth belt. It had a hydraulic buffer at the rear with a reservoir. This was done to allow Maxim to change the resistance on the breech at will. This would aid greatly in experimentation. The action was unlocked, and while nominally recoil operated, the activating factor was a piston fitted into the base of each cartridge, which was blown back into the breech when fired. So this is a primer activated gun. So obviously requiring special ammunition makes Forerunner more of a test bed than something Maxim would sell. He actually didn't want to show it around very much, realizing its inherent weaknesses. Instead, it served to lock down more concepts in patent form, and then was quickly done away with. After this piston primer Forerunner, Maxim would actually get into gas-operated design. At first we'll see him go for the good old gas trap, although at this point it was very new technology. Now while this idea gave a general form for the receiver and contributed to the feeding mechanism, Maxim would only tinker in gas operation for now. From his other notes, we can see that he had a hit not only on the gas trap, but on the gas piston as well, designs usually more associated with John Browning, who would come later. With the concepts proven, it's time to actually make the facility. So he opens up a small workshop in London uh, with a handful of talented individuals to help him make parts and things like that. And he designs a gun, a rapid fire gun. Now, he's using a short recoil locking action with a piston arm somewhat reminiscent of what his father had designed years ago. He's using a belt feed. Again, a much simpler version of what his father had tried to do years ago. Single barrel, uh, which by the way is neat at the time. Uh, most things were multi-barreled, as you saw earlier, uh, in terms of rapid-fire guns. That's to do with heat, more on that in a moment. And then he selected the 45 caliber Gatling gun cartridge as his test bed cartridge, because it was already popular and in widespread use. So you end up with this crazy-looking box. And by the way, it featured a prominent rate adjuster on one side. Looking under the skin, oh boy, that's a lot going on. Notice a rotating piston action, which actually goes back and forth alternating for each round. This two-spool gun has a belt that feeds onto a star wheel, which passes the cartridge up to the bolt, where it is driven into the chamber. That green bit up top is the lock, keeping the bolt and barrel together for a short distance before unlocking. We can also see how the breech extension rotates the feed wheel, changing linear force into rotary force. Okay, this goes a lot deeper, and you again should check out VBB SMYT to see more of this gun. Just know that it also ejects the spent cases and has a mechanical accelerator to help punch up the recoil force. So like the Forerunner, this gun got a nickname, the Prototype. And this 1884 Prototype really explained one clear thing to Maxim right away, which is that when you burn rounds this fast, you make heat. And so cooling was going to be very, very important. And for that, he got out his pen and paper and did some quick math along with some observations. One round of 45 Gatling being fired produced enough heat to raise one pound of water 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit. So he declared 
As it requires as much heat to evaporate one pound of water as it does to melt five pounds of iron, it will be obvious that weight for weight, water is much more effective than iron in absorbing the heat. That would mean the birth of the water jacket, and obviously why it was included for a number of years in any sustained fire design. Finally satisfied that he had a gun worth showing, Maxim would exhibit the 1884 fairly widely, earning praise and even a gold medal at the International Invention Exhibition. Now at this point, the prototype's doing pretty well and it's getting a lot of attention, but there is one sticking point. And it's a sticking point that affected other guns before the prototype as well. Uh, that is ammunition. At this time, early center fire cartridge, things are very unreliable. I mean, consistently making the correct powder, the correct load, the same performance, wet, dry weather, atmospheric changes, no, you get a lot of variation in ammo in that time. And this is actually part of why Maxim designed his gun the way he did. You see, with the hand crank guns, like I kind of alluded to earlier, if you had a hang fire or something, well, you gotta go slow enough to prevent that. So you, if you really crank through a hand crank gun, yeah, you can fire a lot, but what happens if you get past a cartridge that took a couple extra seconds to cook, and now it goes bang, either fed off somewhere where it shouldn't be, and therefore destroying part of the device, or now just out of battery, throwing brass and sparks everywhere. It kind of depends on what gun we're talking about here as to how dangerous that can be. But it's not good. Well, the good thing about Maxim's device is since the cartridge has to go bang in order to cycle the action, well, then you just get a skip in the fire rate. Like, it just you click and there's a hesitation, hang fire, and then boom, and then you don't have any out-of-battery problems. And if the cartridge is bad, you just manually cycle the action and you're back in business. Yeah. There's other problems with ammunition at this time, which is that he's still dealing with black powder, and yet he's firing it very rapidly. And this is an era in which, you know, you get through 50 rounds on a rifle, and you're starting to get some real problems in terms of fouling. And so when you can do 50 rounds in a second, uh, yeah, your gun's filling up with this soot. And so he really tries to invent around the problem of black powder ammunition, not knowing that Smokeless is just around the corner. He's not psychic. He had actually started back with his older gas trap design using an automatic chamber oiler. He now applied it in a new patent. This document also covered an attempted suppressor, which was well ahead of what would be his own son's later invention. They didn't use baffles though, just bled off into a compartment full of fibrous material and oily gack, which would help with the sound and the blasts of smoke. Also, at one point, he worried about the weight of the belts jamming the action. And so naturally, he invented the top-mounted multi-level pan magazine well before we'll see it on the Lewis gun. So this is an interesting position. We have a man who's already wealthy and famous. I mean, he's famous. Uh, he's a, he's a well-known inventor in his time. He's well appreciated. And he's casually inventing things like gas operation with a piston, direct impingement, recoil force. He's casually inventing, uh, drum magazines and suppressors. And he's just, I got a problem. I'm going to fix it. I got another problem. I'm going to fix it. And he's, he's one man. And some of these things, are so unprovable at that moment that they're just being ignored to be rediscovered by other men later. So as much as he's famous and well-known and considered a genius, he's a genius. <laughs> like, it's more than you even think. Like, we hear his name and it's sort of, it's held up here already. And then you go into the papers and the patents and you go, oh, no, 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 no. Like, he's he was ahead of so many other men. The thing is, he just, if you have to compare Maxim to Browning, Browning's true genius is that he's what you'd get if you took Maxim and combined them with Kijiro Nambu. You get someone who's good at invention and good at refinement of an idea into a closed system that is efficient. So Maxim, while very good on invention, is not necessarily efficient. And that's why I think he gets sort of lost under the, the John Browning mythos. But for that being said, he has a very wide, wide spread on his designs and patents, and he's very early to the game. All right, just a point. No matter how much you love Maxim, you could probably love him a little bit more, especially when he opens his mouth. We're going to see some quotes. Anyway, by November of 1884, he's got enough into his gun that he feels comfortable founding the Maxim Gun Company. And one of those founding members would be Albert Vickers, who, with his brother Tom, ran an old family steelworks known as Vickers, Sons, and Company Limited. We're going to see their importance a little later on. Forming the company means that now we have to look at this much more practically. So, the 1884 was really cool and it worked, but it was made one-off. 
in such a way that did not take into consideration savings in machine time or parts or fabrication. It was also very heavy and he felt that he could lighten up the entire design. Basically, you're going from prototype to product, like appealing to people, usable, and producible. And so he would do what he always did, which is invent, write, patent. To save weight and simplify, the two-wheel feed system is gone. We now work directly from the belt, which is set above the action, dropping the cartridge down into the path of the bolt. Locks, props, hydraulics, and plungers were all ditched down to the bare bones. Also, we see the introduction of the fusee, which was based on the watch spring of the same name. And at this point is an actual clock spring style spiraling in on itself. Also, this design has a fluid rate adjuster that ranged from 650 rounds per minute down to one. You did hear that right, a one round per minute fire rate. I actually debated going into detail on this with animations, etc., but we're pretty limited on time and this feature would be abandoned. Now, supposedly the reason for this is so that you could set up a gun in the daylight, point it at a target that you can see, a hot spot or a break in a wall or something that you fear enemy coming through or congregating at, and then sighting it in in daylight, the sun goes down and you can let that gun run once a minute or however slow as possible to harass that position to keep people out of it overnight. Seems a little strange of a request, but that's supposedly where it came from. Now, the French, it appears, did ask for this and they were trialing the gun. And there's actually a story that Maxim himself relates, which is that while displaying his gun that had this mechanism, uh, apparently it had fired around and just as it had fired, a uh, French officer on horseback shows up and says, oh, is that the new automatic gun? I would really like to see it being fired. And Maxim, who's kicked back in his chair, gestures at the gun some 20 feet away and says, oh, it's being fired now. And he goes, what are you talking about, crazy man? They have a small argument. And then next thing you know, the gun, boom, goes off for the next round, which was very startling and very impressive. You know, while this feature was never pressed into production, I think there is at least one occasion where it could have come in handy. Of course, the British found other ways regardless. Anyway, back to the rails. While helping the British government to unravel the formulation of some German gunpowder, Maxim would meet the then Inspector General, Sir Andrew Clark, who lent some sage advice to make the gun capable of being fully serviced and inspected in the field. Strip, clean, and minor repairs should be easily done bare handed. And Maxim took that advice to heart. And I'm telling you, we've done a lot of machine gun work behind the scenes at this point. Serviceability, ease of disassembly, they matter a lot. Granted, it's been a hundred years of service or non-service for a lot of these guns, but there's not a single machine gun I have touched that has run flawlessly yet. We will see, and I will tell you if that happens, but generally it requires me to do a lot of little tinkering and adjustment and tuning it just into place. These guns have a lot going on, and so the ability to work on them on the go is the difference between being able to have them back in the fight in 10 minutes or 10 days. It's pretty critical. This mentality led to the patent of July 1885, known as the transitional model. The big focus? self-contained sub-assemblies, part groups that can be swapped out as a whole. It also embodied a number of simplifications to the operation of the gun itself, bringing the parts count way down. And really, it is 90% of the gun I have today. Belt Fred from over the top, it was the first design to use the now iconic multifunction extractor. This vertical slide action would rise to pick up the next cartridge on the belt, fall to align it to the chamber, rose again while the chamber held the live cartridge in place and it picked up that next cartridge up top, and then after firing, fell again to shunt the spent casing out of the action. This design also sports the coil spring powered fusee that we'll recognize in a moment. Locking is accomplished by a cylindrical crossbar riding in a curving channel in the breech block. When first fired, the barrel and breech block travel together, locked. But that cylinder is turned by striking a projection on the outside of the receiver, tipping it down and free of the breech block. This allows the breech block to carry on rearward alone. Notice this is not quite the toggle arm that we'll see later, despite being a sort of inside out toggle action and clearly the same principle overall. The sear and firing pin setup will actually mostly stay the same with minor adjustments, including the out of battery safety up top. Now, in some ways, this is where the uh, design family tree splits because 
Uh, branching off to one side, Maxim has now figured out that this gun and the way its action is set up can be scaled quite large. Okay, maybe this is a little excessive, but by 1885, he had produced an example for a naval deck gun and the British Navy loved them. The design would actually survive nearly unchanged for decades. Heck, here's some World War I footage of what are basically called pom-poms in use by the Germans, nicknamed for their huge, rapid sound. Well, the pom-pom seems to have helped Maxim finalize simplifications to the 1885, because by 1887, we see the perfected design. It's so close to our gun today that we'll catch it in our later animation. Some of you are looking at the clock and saying, okay, good, we're getting close to me actually handling this. Uh, no, sorry guys, there's still a lot more history. It's a big story. No, uh, we have the gun, mostly. We need to talk about who's going to adopt it. Like, who is actually going to take in something like this and field it not really knowing the full potential of it just yet. Well, generally when we think of the Maxim, lots of people think of Germany, or even Russia. The truth is just about everyone adopted it at some point, but at first, the Maxim Gun Company put its native Britain in its sights. Now the British government had been watching the Maxim since the successful 1884 model, and they even put together something of a first machine gun board to determine just what they wanted from the new system in order to consider adoption. The gun should be no more than 100 pounds in weight, it should be able to fire 400 rounds a minute, and 600 rounds in 2 minutes, and 1,000 rounds in 4 minutes. Those last two are really there to force magazine slash belt changes into the equation. Well, by the time these prerequisites were established, Maxim had already smashed them with his 1887. So he sent along three guns, two standard models with water jackets. These weighed 60 pounds or so, basically good for use anywhere. And one lightened model in which the gun was only 40 pounds because much of the cooling system was housed in a naval cone mount. This was specifically fitted to handle cycling fresh water into the jacket with a compressed air reservoir. In testing, this this gun fired some 3,000 cartridges continuously while remaining cool enough to operate. All three were purchased, but no contracts resulted right away. Britain was still trying to figure out what they were looking at and how to apply it. And so, while they were thinking, Maxim still had some guns to sell. So he went to the world market and started entering trials or while well, kicking down doors. More on that in a moment. Uh, what you need to know about the sort of stage as it's set is that a number of countries are either considering or have just adopted small numbers, but not large numbers, of these repeating guns that were already in the market. We mentioned these before, but the big three, man, it's a lot of threes. Uh, we've got the Gardner, we've got the Gatling, and we've got the Nordenfeld. Well, they were competing amongst each other to be the best manual action, but Maxim had made his gun specifically to undermine the basis of these guns, marked them as inferior for the reasons we've already stated. Well, guess what happens when you show up with a gun specifically designed to discredit the operating principle of the other guns? And you are right. You clean house. He showed up late to the Swiss, Italian, and Austro-Hungarian competitions. Each power had already adopted either the Gardner or Nordenfeld, or both to some degree. Each had contracts pending final decisions, and he just waltzed in and smoked months or years of testing. His gun was four times lighter, four times faster firing, devoid of a myriad of technical issues. It was easily operated by two men, where four struggled to man the rest. In one Swiss test, they had him take aim at a mock artillery battery some 1,200 meters distant, but he had only calculated up to 1,000 meters on his site. So he took some Kentucky elevation and let loose with 11 millimeter Mauser ammunition, still not even smokeless. The Swiss estimated three quarters of all men and horses were killed in just one minute of fire. I think I'm still underselling this. I mean, this thing is one man portable. I can pick this up. You saw me pick this up. It's one man portable. Although at that point it was a little heavier than this. I mean, this almost 20 pounds more than this, but still one guy could, you know, hulk it up and trot along with it. And then <clears throat> like one guy could theoretically run it. I mean, it wouldn't be great. It's better to run it with a team. It's more efficient, but I mean, it's not hard to just sort of get that stuff in there, rack it up and then pull the trigger, push the trigger in this case. So realistically, and by the way, you're not exhausting yourself cranking it the whole time you're trying to fire and aim the thing. You just hit a button. And then it runs like voodoo magic. It does everything on its own. No real attention needed. And then it decimates everything. I mean, just cuts down everything in its path. It's absolutely phenomenal in comparison to its precursors. It sweeps the deck. It's perfect. And so, I mean, by the way, it'd be fine if it did all this stuff. 
and then it turned out to be kind of weaker than the other guns. Like, it's sensitive, it's delicate, there's lots of little fiddly bits, right? The Italians took the thing, stuck it in the ocean for three days, pulled it out, and just loaded it and fired it. And it fired fine after three days in salt water. It's reliable, it's strong, and it's just amazing. So of course, they would actually be the first to adopt, taking in like 26 of them in August of 1888. They're, Italy led the way, they're like, no, 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 we're going with that. Not a lot, because we don't have a lot of money, but we're, we're going with that. With that little order locked in, Maxim would head to Austria-Hungary, again crushing the Nordenfeldt and selling 131 guns. This would be the first significant order, arriving in time for the 8 by 50 millimeter rim to cartridge, making it the first small bore smokeless Maxim as well. Now this Maxim gun was troublesome for Nordenfeld, who had years of development and tons of cash on the line in the form of his gun, purchased from Helga Palmkrantz. Without the Maxim on the scene, it was going to be a huge financial success, but now it was practically worthless. Nordenfeldt was a proud man, but thankfully his biggest salesman was not. Nicknamed the Merchant of Death, Basil Zaharoff is worth doing your own research on. I recommend the Great War video about him as a brief introduction to his notoriety. The shortest story I can tell is that he was as brilliant as he was unscrupulous, and knew that no matter how well he played his hand, the Nordenfeldt was done for. So Zaharoff convinced Nordenfeldt to partner with Vickers and Maxim. One side got in on the better gun instead of being beaten by it, and the other got access to a worldwide network of government officials, ordnance departments, and one extremely talented salesman. Now, I should say Maxim and Norden felt the individuals did not really like this idea. Both thought they could stand on their own merits, but luckily their business partners convinced them of the extreme potential profits, and a deal was struck in July of 1888, forming the Maxim Nordenfeldt Guns and Ammunition Company Limited. With this complete, sample guns in various chambering started flying out doors. Granted, they were two or three units at a time, but this was a weapon so advanced people needed to see it to believe it. Now, these sample orders were very small, and the company not yet profitable. This lack of income doomed Thorsten Nordenfeldt to personal bankruptcy, because he had already spent money that he didn't have. And so, he sold out of his shares in January of 1890. Returning home, he would discover a machine gun designed by a Swedish army captain, W. Bergman. Uh, not that Bergman. He would actually try to pit this design against the Maxim, clearly attempting to head it off as his Nordenfeldt had been head off by the Maxim. I'm not sure why he tried this because he had already signed a 25-year non-compete agreement and would be sued into retirement. Alright, so 1890, the world is now aware that this gun exists and is potentially very dangerous and useful. Uh, They've been sold to Austria-Hungary, Italy, and a number of other smaller powers in even smaller numbers. Really, at this point, Austria-Hungary is sort of the one that has the first three-digit, you know, let's do this thing. Now, it's time for the UK to finally step in, because they've decided, hey, 1890, this thing's doing pretty well, we want it. We're going to order 120, and you guys seem a little overloaded over there, because they were. I mean, it wasn't a huge factory at this time, and it didn't have a lot of capital on hand anymore. Uh, we're going to go ahead and produce these over at Enfield because we like producing things over at, you know, Royal Small Arms Factory Enfield. So you just get us the plans and we'll get this sorted out and we'll get to work. Now this would take some time. Uh, parts production would start in like 1891 and then the full guns would start rolling off the line in 1893. This resulted in the Gun Machine Maxim 4.5 inch Mark I. For the Navy, that was in 45 Gatling, a cartridge they already had in service. The Army and Indian forces would go with 450 577 Martini Henry. By 1899, that cartridge was getting dated though, so the British would convert nearly all existing Maxims to 303. This was done two different ways, one with a thicker, heavier barrel, and the other much lighter. The guns had been produced for the heavier, recoiling black powder cartridge and would not cycle 303 without aid. Luckily, Maxim had already done some research on forcing recoil thanks to making blank fire adapters for his guns, so a set of muzzle boosters would be worked up, the Mark I and Mark II, with the version depending on what sort of barrel weight you had to shove around. That conversion process would be done by about 1915, although a good number of the Indian ones, because of, you know, 577 still being in use there, they stayed in their original cartridge. It was just easier to deal with on the frontier. Now, I wish I had a Mark I to show you here. They're actually not that common in the U.S. market. Surprise, surprise, they were an ally of ours. We don't really have a reason to be capturing many of them, and they weren't a huge uh, sales export. And as we're going to see, there weren't that many. Uh, ideally, if I had had one, it would have been easier to split up these two episodes into three. We could have talked about the British history up to this point, and then we could go on, on into the German and then the Russian. Uh, that just wasn't an option, and I like doing the videos where there's always something for you to see fired, 
So you guys are gonna have to buckle down because now we get to go into the part that is really where we care. Because realistically, Britain sort of froze at this point. Despite being their official machine gun, there actually weren't all that many of these in service in World War I. The total production from what was Maxim Nordenfeldt and would later be Vickers Sons of Maxim, more on that in a moment, would only be about 1,300 units. And the total Enfield production from start to finish in 1917, about 2,500 or so. If these numbers seem crazy small, do not worry, you are not crazy, they are crazy small in the context of the Great War. Now you'd expect to see them balloon by 1916 as reality and demand set in, but actually Britain would mostly focus on a later adaptation of the Maxim that came out during the war, the Vickers. We've actually already laid hands on one of these, so this set of episodes is making the way for that episode to be possible in the not too distant future. So that just leaves us with this gun today. A German Maxim, which is actually quite different. Um, you can't tell yet, but if you're paying close attention to the images, this whole thing is very different looking. This is much smaller. We'll get into all that in just a moment, but first we gotta talk about why Germany's even looking at this gun. Now, they had seen it right after Austria-Hungary, but they hadn't taken a strong interest at first. This would change with Kaiser Wilhelm II, who visited Spandau in 1888 on the insistence of Prince Albert Edwards, who was incredulous that he had not seen the gun yet. Maxim himself was on hand, and despite a small miscommunication about locking the traverse, one that led to the Kaiser almost mowing down most of his gust, had Maxim not been handy to halt the gun, yeah, despite that, everyone was quite impressed. Uh, Will Helm II is even quoted as saying, that is the gun, there is no other, and personally ordered a few for his Dragoon Guards regiment. Following this display, Germany actually got moving, a bit. Fritz Krupp would negotiate a deal in May of 1888 for production, but this would fall through by 1891. Instead, Krupp only worked on pom-poms. Into the void would step Ludwig Lova, although, as you may recall, it was being led by Isidore Lova at this point. They signed a seven-year agreement with Maxim Nordenfeldt. Lova would produce for Germany, but any exports had to be approved by Maxim Nordenfeldt. Now, Lova would produce a clone of the British model starting in 1894, but quickly the company would change names. Remember from our Gewehr 1888 episode that the company Ludwig Lova would become embroiled in controversy over what was known as the Judenflinten. Watch that episode for all the details, but know that this was a whole mess of anti-Semitism. This caused Ludwig Lova to break out their arms fabrication business into Deutsche Waffen und Munition Fabriken. Now in terms of sales, the German Navy liked the 1894 Maxim because they were unconcerned about weight or maneuverability at this point. It just ran, so they would get to buying. The army was less impressed and it would take up until 1899 for them to adopt. Okay, we're almost there, right? We've got the German army actually adopting in 1899. We're in Germany, Ludwig Lovas producing now DWM. This is made by DWM. We're nearly there, we've almost got the MG08 and I can finally start to show you this gun. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very long story. So, uh, instead, I have to tell you that while we're talking about this period, one member of the Lova family would get fed up with the anti-Semitism and take a trip over to Britain. Sigmund Lova, younger brother to Ludwig and Isidore, would flee to London to serve in Nordenfeldt's vacated role at the Maxim Company. This would be the managing director. And he arrived just in time. You see, Maxim Nordenfeldt was still not making a profit, and it's no wonder why. It was kicking samples out around the world, and only smaller orders were coming in so far, but its various growth phases had taken on a number of workshops and factories. I mean, we've got shops in Erith, Crayford, Dartford, Wilmington, Birmingham, Stockholm, and an association in Spain that demanded attention and parts exchange. In addition, for the first time, a true competitor had arrived on the field, the Colt 1895. Now, this gun would kick off a fight between Maxim and Browning. This gets into like recoil-operated Brownings and gas-operated Maxims. We'll talk about this more when we talk about the Browning 1917. Anyway, Maxim would also create an extra light air-cooled model that I'm not gonna go into huge detail today, but that thing was dangerous beyond 400 round bursts. And that's Maxim's words. It went nowhere and it didn't need to as his gun was still secure. We'll talk more about the potato digger another time, I hope. The point is, Maxim 
Maxim found it very annoying and considered it a violation of his patent on gas operation. So it got him tinkering, competing again. But this is just as his guns are supposed to be going into full production in Britain. He just kept showing up at Aerith and Enfield, making last minute adjustments to everything. It stalled production by up to a year and started to cost real money. It also didn't help that he was going deaf and after 10 years of displaying the world's first machine gun with no real hearing protection, I can't imagine why. So he was barred from the production lines and given his own personal workshop to keep him busy. Meanwhile, Albert Vickers had led his family on a quest to no longer be steel workers and arms makers, but to produce whole warships from scratch in house to sell them to the government. Ships, engines, guns, all under one name. Vickers, Sons, and Maxim Limited, formed in 1897 by purchasing Barrow Shipbuilding and Maxim Nordenfeld. For those of you familiar with trying to organize even a family picnic, this prospect was insanity itself. And yet Vickers had a secret weapon, Sigmund Lova. He sorted the company, simplified the assets, streamlined the whole dang process for everyone. He was loved and feared in equal measure, a taskmaster and saint. Wherever there was inefficiency, he sought it out and crushed it. Navigating strikes, handling rogue inventors, and even marketing the gun personally. Heck, he leased a country estate so he could host foreign diplomats, including Chinese statesman Li Hung Chang, who delighted at cutting down trees with the Maxim guns on hand and further earning sales. Unfortunately, in 1903, much of the hardest work out of the way, Lova would be killed in a traffic accident, leaving a sudden hole in the company. Now this would be filled by Arthur Trevor Dawson, a naval gunnery specialist of merit whose name would dot the upcoming patent improvements. He had already been working for the company, heading a multi-year project to further refine and lighten the Maxim gun. This would be the model 1901 new pattern. Now it's a lightened gun that actually borrowed heavily from that failed, remember dangerous, almost 400 round max burn Maxim ultralight model, that little whatever. Well, in trying to pare that gun down to its bare minimums, he had worked out a better way of presenting this sort of uh, lock work. And so that got rolled in by Dawson and some of the other engineers into this new 1901 gun. Note the older 1889 pattern used an overhead projection to drive the joint out of lock. The 1901 used a simpler roller system relying on an S-shaped crank arm to provide the tipping action that would unlock the joint. This was not the only change, however, as the 1901 benefited from a simplified and lightened feed block, a steel water jacket for weight reduction over the previous brass, improved connection to the fusee spring, improved connection to the steam tube, and perhaps most importantly, a simple lock for easy disassembly. The 1889 lock on the left is a mix of cross bolts and cotter pins. Several have to be pulled to disassemble and it requires three hands to get it back together again. The 1901 on the right was designed to be taken apart for servicing on or near the front line. So there's only one split head pin tying it all together. It also had adjustable head space, which is pretty critical. The 1901 export pattern was not adopted at home, but it was in Italy, Portugal, and eventually the United States. Now, thankfully that US model 1904 Maxim was of limited adoption and never served outside of training for the war. I say that because despite being a lightened model, it was tremendously heavy with an extra thick barrel and extra large water jacket and unlovable tripod. Overall, it was a messy, slow adoption riddled with government delays and Colt's usual casual pace. This thing is worth a Lewis gun-like episode all on its own someday, so if somebody knows of one out there that I can borrow, that'd be great, but it's definitely gonna be outside of World War I. Returning to Germany, at this point, DWM's seven-year leash agreement is up, and they start selling at will to whoever will buy. They do still have to pay royalties, though. The German government also took note of the new Model 1901, but they wanted to keep them compatible with their previous Model 1899, and so requested the improved guns with the old, fixed head space, hard to disassemble lock. This results in the MG01. This pattern would also be adopted by countries like Chile and Bulgaria, but nowhere near enough were purchased in Germany itself. Now, for the sake of time and sanity, I have to start splitting this between the next episode. You see, right about here is where we'd really start talking about Russian involvement in the Maxim. I'm not gonna try to squeeze all that. So we're gonna push Russia and some tactics over to the next episode. I'm gonna stay, of course, with Germany and work our way towards the MG08 in this episode. 
For now, you just need to know that the Russians had the Maxim in hand for the Russo-Japanese War. The Japanese had tried the Maxim in their Black Powder Murata cartridge, but went with a clone of the French Hotchkiss now in 6.5. The Russo-Japanese War really hammered home the importance of the machine gun on the battlefield, and despite a Russian defeat, they fared way better when the Maxim could be employed properly. German observers noticed and took the lesson to heart. Germany now truly wanted the Maxim. Now, Germany knew it wanted to buy in bulk, and they wanted to future-proof their design before they just adopted it. So they took a look at the Maxim as it was. At this point, don't forget, the 1894 Naval slash Army 99 is just the same as the British 1889 slash 90. It's the original, you know what I mean? It's the big, heavy, 56-pound, maybe plus, Maxim gun. Uh... They're going, can we shave some weight anywhere we can? And so with Spandau's help working alongside a DWM, they really start to trim things down. They go, how thin can the receiver walls be? How small can these parts be before they break? Uh, can we use a better quality steel? Uh, can we get away from brass on this part? Can we get away from... And so it's just every little tweak to shave as much weight as possible. Now, there's one thing that they did add more weight in for, though, which was a bracket on the left side of the gun that is actually not currently on this gun, and that was so that they could mount one of these. Uh, this is actually a ZF-12, which is a two and a half optical, if I may. Hey, that's pretty cool, right? Now, uh, we don't have the room to actually use this device, but it was nice that we relent it so that I could show it to you. Um, this is a really good idea because this is putting into mind how the machine gun is going to be used, not just direct fire, but also indirect fire, and also at good range. I mean, there's a lot of faith going into this gun. If you're going to say that almost standard, you're going to include an optical, you know, glass complicated sight. This is fairly expensive stuff for the time that it came out in. So, uh, again, I'll give you some nice photos of that in just a second if you want to see it closer, but we did not have the range to fully use that particular sight. Just thought you'd enjoy seeing it a little closer while we had it here. Now that all wraps up in, you won't guess what year, for the MG-08. Yeah, it's 1908. Um, now I should say, by the way, the reason I couldn't even show you that optic mounted is that this gun is a mixed master, and we're going to look at it closer, obviously. But just be warned, this has had a very well-loved history. It appears to have been captured at some point and peened. Uh, it's got the drill holes for where the mount would have been, but the mount is now lost to us. Stuff like that. So this is not like the world's most perfect Maxim. This is a rugged, ready-to-go Maxim. And as we're going to see shooting it and uh, playing around with it here on the show, this gun is about as poor condition as you can get. And if it had been any other gun, I don't think it would have run. I mean, there's some pitting that's been cleaned back up and some other issues, and it just goes. It just, the gun functions as long as you get it set up correctly. That's good. This is as, as poor condition as it might be in some ways. It is excellent as an embodiment of what is the rugged durability of this particular weapon. Anyway, let's go ahead and get a closer look as I bring this gun oh, where you might be able to see it. So let me just correct my bench a bit. And I know that I have to be careful of my focus plane for you guys. So this should be nice and sharp by now. All right, so oh, let me push that forward. This is gonna be a fun experiment. We have our improved post-1901 roller with our handle. And if you're curious, this guy right here, and I'm sorry I'm not patented plastic, but I don't have a lot of room anymore. Uh, this guy is actually a rebound preventer. So in that nanosecond that this guy hits down on the roller, that guy pops back up and prevents it from sort of vibrating. You saw this kind of on the Luger. Uh, this prevents it from sort of like bouncing in and out of lock and having some mechanical problems or jams there. Nice little system. All right, we have our feed tray where we would feed a belt. More on that in a moment. And then if we turn her around to the rear and bear with me as I turn this mighty ship and scoot and scoot, uh, we've got our ability to fire. So we have a safety here and all that really does is it lifts this little guy. You could actually do that and push it into fire. Uh, but in this case, see how it's sort of just freewheeling now? That's all it does, it just lifts up that guy. That's just a block that keeps you from being able to depress the trigger, it's just a trigger lock. Um, so you would flip that, push in, that's gonna start the gun rocking and rolling. While we're back here, there's an inspection cover here. Uh, if you flip that over, uh, I shouldn't say inspection actually, this is actually for cleaning. 
Um, this guy lines up with a hole in the interior, which if the lock is out, you can then see all the way through the gun and out the bore. That allows you to run either a cleaning rod or most likely a pull through to quickly clean out the bore of the gun without having to disassemble the whole thing. Pretty cool. Uh, and again, there's like a hole through here. I'm not sure how well that shows, but you guys get the idea. Uh, at the rear also, we have our sight. So I'm just gonna bring this till she's in the correct plane. This is actually down and you can't read it in the down position. You have to put the sight up. Now, once you're sighted in, you could just pop it down because the gun's already dialed in uh, on the cradle where it needs to go. So that's fine. This is adjustable. It's not shown up well in screen. Uh, I'll get you a photo in just a moment. So uh, sight back down. And if we look at the left side of the gun, which is going to be very complicated because I'm here. <laughs> All right. Uh, there we go. We've got our fuzzy cover and we have the ability to set our spring tension here for the fuzzy. This affects rate of fire on the gun and is adjustable for ammo. So I can just crank this little guy and we're gonna see more of this later on in the show. So how do we get into this gun is what a lot of you are probably thinking, but you're gonna have to wait because there's still more external features. Cause I gotta scoot this down until you can see the barrel jacket and try to keep my depth of field. So on this side here, this is where we would fill our water jacket and then all the way at the front, which I'm going to have to now do a whole big turnaround. <laughs> the problem is I'm getting better at this with practice. Oh, and I'm completely eradicating my mark that tells me where I'm in focus. So let's hope for the best. All right, we're back around, walking our back. Okay. Whew. This guy has a lever to control draining the barrel jacket so that we can uh, go ahead and get our water out when it's necessary. This unfortunate soul had some left inside and she's getting a de-rusting before she goes home. And then if I roll her back over a little bit, I've taken out the Chicago style fitting, but right there's a hole that would normally have a fitting on it with a piece of hand grabber that's gonna go to a tube. That's for the evaporating gas to come down drop into a box and condense. We'll talk more about that later. And at the front, we got our muzzle booster and I'll show you that in just a second. So, whoo, still going. And for those of you who hate it when I grunt, I'm not gonna give you one inch on this one. I'm grunting all the way through. So, gun forward, whoo, button at the rear, right? We're gonna pop this cover. It's gonna let us see down into the action. Turn this guy over. And there we have her in all of her beauty. Let me get her settled in just a bit. So you're looking down from the top, and if I can give myself just a little clearance on this side, yep, there we go. You can see how the lock works. So there's the arm bending down inside as I rack forward. And that's prepping for the next cartridge. Uh, I'll show you that actually in just a second. And then release forward, she's all the way home. Now, how that works is actually pretty cool. Ooh, I'm gonna pick this up for just a second so she doesn't fall. You stay there. And then I'm gonna reach down here. We have a actually technically Vickers cloth belt. These just worked a little bit better and it's what we had on hand, but it's gonna run and reasonably it's just the same. I mean, there's not a lot of difference. If you wanna get into different belts for World War One, there's a number of evolutions and I would really recommend the reading down in the link. Uh, these orange snap caps were actually provided by somebody who I've recently made contact with uh, 3D Arsenal, they're setting up a website and everything just so that they can start doing custom stuff like this. Uh, 8 millimeter miles are fairly common, but we're already talking to them about custom 3D printing things like Kropacek so that we can better show you how some of these pieces work. Uh, if you got an unusual cartridge that you kind of need to have to sort of function check, maybe check them out because they've really done us a favor on these guys. So let's take a look. Uh, I will try to get this back into view and focus. And then we're gonna feed her in to our well, feed block, pull her in all the way. Now, I'm gonna tip her over and hopefully there's just enough clearance to show you how this is gonna work. I'm just gonna move the belt out there. We got a couple of fake rounds and we'll settle her in, okay? So, as we rack this forward, we will then be able to pull the first cartridge right there, see the bright orange? This is why I like this system. Let me make sure 
absolutely certain that you guys have some level of focus on this. There we go. First one's ready to go. See her in there. There we go. This is experiment number one for giant machine gun showing. So if I let this back forward, I would normally do it with a very quick, sharp snap. She's going to go forward. As she goes forward, these guys rise up. This whole sliding piece rides up. We'll see it better in the animation. It grabs the first cartridge. Now, if I rack her again, oops, see, this is why you gotta snap it. Hold on, there's a lot of drag here. Give me one second. Snap it. There we go. And then she's gonna pull her out, drop her down, which gravity's not helping with at the moment, but she should be fine. See how she dropped down? And it's aligned with the chamber now. So as it comes forward again, it would put it in the chamber. Now, if I'm loading this gun, I gotta make sure I pay attention to now yanking this guy all the way over. This would be a two-handed operation on a mount. I'm doing this on the table like an idiot. So uh, there we go. I'd yank it over one more time. You're gonna see May do this, by the way. And then I would let it go and I'd have a lot of spring tension, although I've let it all out for this demonstration. So I'd let it go again. It would snap over. Uh, let me see if that was, yeah, that was sharp enough. So it would snap over. So now if I pull this trigger or push this trigger in this case and fire the weapon with these dummy rounds, you know, boom, okay, in theory. Well, that would have discharged our one line with our bore and we'd still have a live one up top. So the gun would go bang, it would cycle back, not with me doing it. And when it cycled back, it would take that lower cartridge, which is now spent, drop it down and align it up with an ejection port. And then it would take the next cartridge and line it up with a chamber. Now, in theory, if this had gone bang, the whole system would have already pulled the belt over during the bang period, and this cartridge would already be picked up, but you wouldn't be able to see what I'm doing at this point. Again, gonna be a lot clearer in animation. Don't feel like you gotta memorize anything at this point. So, if I take the gun, woohoo, close her back up for a second, and move her around to the front where you can see there is an ejection port right at the front. And I am running out of cloth and space. Haha, -ha. right there, right? Well, if I let her back forward, you notice nothing's come out. And that's because the first cartridge, or rather the last cartridge that was spent, the spent casing that's sitting in there, that is held by a spring and it keeps mud and muck from re-entering through the ejection port until the second one comes around. Now, I'm not sure if these snap caps are gonna be fierce enough. Let me see real quick. Yeah, there we go. Look at that, pooped it right out. So uh, this would have been the next one around. And by the way, uh, for being 3D printed, these are holding together really well. I'm beating the crap out of them with this gun. <sighs> okay, so that's operation. What about actual assembly, disassembly? Let me get this line back up for just a second. If you want to take your cartridges out uh, because you're tired of this belt or whatever, push the button, pull free, and we are good to, to drop these. Thank you again, uh, 3D Arsenal. These are super cool. Now, I'm gonna swing her back around and we'll look at disassembly. So, push button at the rear, pop open. Now I'm going to rack forward. Uh, I still have some stray dummies in here, so I'm gonna move those out of my way. Well, one of them is gonna live in there because that's where it wants to be. All right, we make sure she's clear. There you go. And then, holding her forward, you want to lift this action out from the front and then turn. Now, this gets tricky. Because this thing can realign and actually be accidentally discharged out of battery, the Germans would really emphasize holding it in such a way that you could not have an out of battery. Uh, in this case, I just make sure it's absolutely clear. I clear everything off of it and I take it out of the gun, but I'm not in a war zone. So twist just about 45 degrees and boom, she pops right out. This is the lock that we were talking about before. I'm gonna set that aside because it's not getting disassembled any further because that is the old style lock and I don't wanna mess with that. Instead, I'm going to close her back down for just a second so I can show you that fusee. So, I've got the spring tension dialed pretty low. And in order for you to see what I'm doing, I'm gonna to have to flip this gun upside down essentially. There we go. Uh, this is probably as good as we're gonna get for the moment. Uh, there's a spring here that needs to be depressed. And then I push the whole fusee cover forward off of its mount and away from the body 
of the gun, which is easier said than done on camera. Once she comes loose, you just gotta make sure she, let me get this back into the frame. This little hook needs to come off of this little armature here, and that's what's transferring everything over to the lock. So, oh, Fousey's off, everything's floating free. By the way, this is not necessarily the recommended order. I'm just doing things as quickly as possible to sort of thin this gun down so that I can do it on a desk. Um, anyway, I'll pop her back open. You can literally just lift the feed block assembly out, and I could have done that a lot sooner, but again, these are all sub-assemblies, so there's not, there's an ideal way to do this efficiently, but you're starting to see that so many things in this gun are sort of independently related. You can service parts of the gun without taking the whole gun apart, and that means that you can tackle it from different approaches. So, feed block out of the way. Cover needs to be up for this next part. I'm going to move back into frame and lower her down where you can see that there is a thumb pad slash cross pin. Push that up, push the pin through. And then the pin comes out, all clear. And that allows me to do this, which is drop this whole handle assembly back. And then from there, I can actually start pulling apart the sort of barrel and lock. So uh, you can punch this pin and further take it apart. That's actually not set up to do quickly. Uh, and it requires a little more force. Like you gotta take a hammer to it, pop her all the way out. And it's not really that necessary for field servicing, so I'm gonna leave it. Now, at this point, I've got basically two tabs at the rear that need to come off. One of them on this gun is very easy to just pop off. And that was just part of one of those three mounting points for the fusee cover. And then on this side, for whatever reason, this guy's always been stiff, so I'm just gonna turn her over on her side. And instead of fighting her or slamming her around and making a ton of noise, I'm just gonna take a rubber mallet. Now, you don't have to use a rubber mallet for this. If it is even a little stuck, you can just take the bolt arm and work it back and forth, but that's gonna be a lot of metal clanging, so I'm just gonna do rubber on metal. Again, not necessary, just a little easier. So, what did that get me? That got me our rebound preventer and our roller block that's designed to sort of let this arm bounce off of it. <sighs> this is the cool part. So, now that I've trashed everything around me, I'll line her back up and pull, and pull, and pull. Now there's a little moisture in here because she was run with a water jacket, and as much as I have been in there oiling her, there's still some residual moisture. It's very hard to pack these things down. Uh, that water jacket really holds on to moisture. Uh, so now we're dealing with pretty much a skeleton, uh, exoskeleton, except for that booster. More on that in just a moment. I'm gonna set her aside. And by the way, the reason to leave the front booster to last is that would be where the seal was. We'll talk about those in a minute. But basically, as it is, you've disrupted the rear barrel seal. Let me show you that. So right in this groove here, you would have some um, asbestos string wrapped around, and then that would seal, all this is water, you can see some moisture on it too. All this is suspended in water, you don't want water coming back in here. So there's a, a asbestos string that goes here, that keeps the water from coming back while it's moving back and forth in there, and there's a big cowling for that. And then at the front, you notice there's no relief, because the washer is being carried by uh, being pressed between the muzzle booster and the jacket, that's also big asbestos ring. Those are no longer available, so you're gonna see ours drip a little bit. Uh, anyway, more on that in a moment. But basically, the way that's set up, I can pull the barrel out, I can check this rear seal, and the front seal remains mostly intact because it's being held by the booster and the water jacket. All right, at the rear, if we need to swap out the barrel itself, it's pretty simple. Just pull this guy away, pull this guy away. There's sort of the body of your lock, sort of the carrier, I guess you could say, uh, and the lock itself which is just this little elbow joint. And again, you'll see this run in the animation. And then, here's our barrel. And it's that straightforward. Now, you're watching me struggle with a lot of this sitting in a desk in a room, but realistically, when it's on a mount, it's extremely easy to do this. Like, you just sort of, the gun is suspended, you pop the top, you pop the bottom, it all comes out in moments. And I've done it six or seven times over trying to field diagnose this gun when we were getting it running. It's super easy, and as someone who's had to sort of work on one, I really like this system. I think it's very productive and very good. All right, so I promised you one last look at that muzzle booster. Now I pre-loosened this. Normally you would have to take a wrench to it. That's one of the few things that are actually sort of pressed in there. 
Uh, there's the muzzle booster. So you would wrench it off. And this thing is pretty simple. It's got sort of a flash shroud to it. And, oh, this is sort of an earlier pattern. There would be another pattern that came out with the MG-08 that was a little simpler, but the idea behind this guy is to take some of that excess gas pressure, and it really, we're turning the barrel into a piston. So even though it's a recoil-operated gun, we can oomph up on the recoil by putting gas pressure backwards on the barrel. And you can hear, it's just a slidey bit of metal in there. This is really pressed in there. I'm not gonna break this apart for you this right now, but all it is is there's enough room in there to sort of push gas away and back on the barrel and then have it bleed off as the barrel retracts. And so that just oomphs up the pressure, keeps the recoil running well, a little bit of a flash hider there. Now, there is one thing that is not uh, on this particular gun that you see in a lot of photos, which is a big ring around the muzzle booster. Uh, just so you're aware of that part, it has one specific and interesting function. It's actually meant to block any flash or vapor that might come from the sides of the muzzle booster, helping to further prevent giving away your position. Whew. All right, while I get all this back together, um, let's go ahead and get it over to an animation because I feel like as much fun as it was to watch me struggle with that, and especially, uh, I'm not taking this thing apart, guys. This thing is a bajillion pins. It's a complete pain in the butt. And realistically, it would not be taken apart uh, actually, Germany issued three of these per machine gun just to prevent exactly that. Uh, you would use one up, and if it had a problem, you would get into the other two, and then that way there's plenty of time for a field armor to really look into the lock. Uh, most countries would use only, like, one. Uh, anyway, excuses aside, let's just use some x-ray specs and, again, tune into our good friend VBB uh, and see how this thing really works down to the nuts and bolts. Right away, we can see the adjustable fusee spring at work on the left side of the action, and how it yanks the action back into lock, using a linkage to take that linear spring force and turn it into the rotation of the locking arm. Follow the ammunition from the belt, dropping to the chamber and then to the ejection port. From here, the red indicator marks the point at which the extension on the left plate drives the overhead arm on the feed block. This pulls the belt through the system. Unlike the example I made on my desk, with the lid closed, a set of leaf springs drive the vertical slide on the lock downwards, allowing for it to work in any orientation. Here we see how the action is unlocked. That knee joint is bent by the S-shaped crank arm striking the roller. Once unlocked, the recoil force folds the joint, retracting the lock. You can also see that as the joint rises, it tips a set of fingers that then tip another set of fingers that lift up the slide back into the up position. All right, now let's look inside that mysterious lock. Along the base of the receiver in gray is the transfer bar from the trigger. When depressed, it pulls back on the blue sear, which releases that little pink part there. Essentially, it's a rotating cocking piece, releasing the striker forward, and being cocked at the rear by the shank at the rear of the lock when it turns downward, almost like a thumb pressing down a hammer. The green bit is a safety, preventing out of battery fire until that joint comes all the way back up and puts everything into lock. And really, that's the whole of the action. It seems incredibly complicated from afar, but hopefully quite simple now. There are some little fiddly bits that require a bit more detail, but I think you got it. So let's get this over to May for proper demonstration.
Hey, all right. So uh, number one, I had told you guys that the original weight on these was like 56 pounds. I'm not sure, so I'm gonna make sure I say it again. They brought it down to 40 pounds. I think I missed that point. So not unmanageable, but still fairly heavy. I mean, yeah, I can pick it up, but it's it's not it's an awkward weight, especially since a lot of it is over here to the rear at this point. All right. Number two, uh, I'm sure some of you had some concerns about that video that you just saw. Uh, I just have gotten used to the way I get comments. So let's start off with the fact that yes, it was dripping. That's because we did not have any original asbestos seals from a hundred years ago that were perfectly fit for the front of this gun. And we went with what we could work up at the hardware store that would take the heat. And it did well enough that it only dripped a little and blew some vapor. That's fine. Uh, the gun's functioning fine. We hold it back up. It's not gonna rust. Uh, in warfare, that would not be happening because they would have had the specific seals for this specific gun. This is just a hundred years later making do. Uh, number two, some of you might notice that it had a very high fire rate. Now we did also lend this to IV8888 and there were a lot of comments on that. That particular day, uh, the lock work had a little slop in it and at a higher fire rate, it didn't have the time to wander left and right and it just stayed running for us instead of jamming. After we left that film day, Mark did some tinkering. We managed to get it running a little bit better. So we're gonna see later in this episode, some lower rate fire as we loosen up this spring. Stay tuned. Now, part three, I'm sure some of you, well, part three of the concerns, part four of my points. Uh, I'm sure some of you were concerned about that hose hanging off the front of the gun because that seems pretty cool and steampunk, literally steam. Uh, that hose is actually so that as you run this gun and it heats up, the steam can go out of a hole, down the hose, and into a handy dandy watering can. Now, uh, there was actually an earlier version of this thing that I wanna make sure you guys are aware of. The earliest design was cylindrical, but it proved too heavy and awkward to use, so it was replaced with one ingeniously dimensioned to match an ammunition box, so it could be more easily carried with the equipment. And since I have one here, let's just go ahead and take a look. So uh, this guy is designed to fit where a normal ammo can would. It has two great little handles for actually getting it around. And then, oh, that's clingy loud. And then if we look over in our zoom camera, you can see that we have a filling cap and we have a faucety looking tap. More on that guy in just a second. So uh, here it's sort of spring locked, so you gotta put some tension on it. This is exciting. And then boom, down there, oh, listen to that. Ooh, about. So uh, obviously this guy's got some age on him. By the way, thank you, Jeff, for letting, Jeff has loaned us so much things, like the Lewis gun, the 0815 that you guys haven't seen yet. Uh, this stuff, the scope, like, Jeff, you're the man. Uh, anyway, notice that this is much larger, I'm sorry, I'm making a lot of noise. This is much larger than the hose, which was about the size of my thumb. Uh, that means no seal, so you're wondering, hey, how's that gonna hang on to that steam? Well, you'd actually preload this with some water and then put the hose below the water level so that any steam coming in would then join the water and not evaporate out of this particular container. The idea is to conserve the water. Now, a lot of people think that it auto recycles. It does not. You basically fight this spring. I got it, I got it. It's very annoying sounding. Uh, you basically fill this guy up and then when you want to reclaim the water, you would then just turn this spigot around, take it back over to the gun, and then line it up with that little hole on the top and pour it in. Uh, that's really the whole treat. Uh, it's not any fancier than that. Now, this particular invention was not just a stroke of genius. It wasn't something that just somebody said, hey, this is getting really annoying carrying these cans around on training. No, it took a little bit more for something like this to be invented. As a matter of fact, it came about after war were declared. I'm sorry guys, I had to fit that in there somewhere. Oh, you really love War Were Declared, according to the comments. So, uh, now that we're in the fight, exactly how is this thing being used by the Germans? And I don't mean down to tactics, that's coming 
next episode, but where are they putting the thing? You basically get to name anything. We mostly think of ground use, direct fire on infantry, but also as light artillery, more on that another day. They were also like other MGs employed for anti-aircraft use, which was actually fairly effective given the planes available at the time. The guns were ubiquitous, fielded by the Navy with their own special mounting brackets and cover hold opens and in Zeppelins. Note, this one has a special left side mount for stowage on a Zeppelin. A relative handful of MG-08 were converted to air cool for heavy heavier than air flying contraptions. Some were even made as dedicated air cools from Spandau early on, likely fewer than 1,000 in total, rapidly replaced by the LMG 0815. They would also be provided to allies like Austria-Hungary, and just for fun, this image shows one of the simple express mounts available for the MG 08, making them even more rapidly deployable, and hopefully making up for some of that lack of a light machine gun available to Germany. Rolling back to 1908, these guns were first produced actually by Spandau, and with the word written prominently on it, it's no wonder that non-Germans started to call it the Spandau. Uh, this is not a thing that was shared quite as much at home, but still a cool name. I mean, sounds bad, eh? But anyway, uh, these guns within the year were also produced by DWM, so it wasn't that far behind that both got really rocking and rolling. My reading says that by the time production halted in 1918, Spandau had assembled 40 thousand plus MG 08s. They halted early that year to focus on the 0815. By war's end, DWM had done at least 30,000 MG 08s. Now, Spandau did have one extra advantage in that they took over a construction or assembly line rather uh, in 1915. This was after the capture of FN in Belgium. Uh, they had a machine gun assembly line producing, we'll see a version of this gun. And when they rolled in, they said, hey, FN, you're gonna produce for us. And they said, no, we're Belgian, not German. And so it sat for a bit before they went, all right, pack it up, take it home, we'll use it there. Kind of a cool piece of history. After the war, Germany was limited to only 1,500 machine guns in total, a number they would very likely exceed very quietly. When turning over the guns, they only provided one lock, pocketing the other two, just in case they were needed down the road. This wouldn't be all that necessary though, because post-war Germany would really go on the hunt for a universal machine gun, which kind of left the standard 08 on the back burner into World War II, where they were present, but in a very limited role. Okay, that wraps up the MG-08 gun, but I know a lot of you have probably noticed that sweet sled mount. Well, it was developed over several of Germany's Maxim guns into what it was at the time of the war. These early versions were also four-legged and easy to work with, but ours today is even lighter. It's designed for a two-man team to be able to carry it like a litter and also set up quite easily. Its layout allowed it to be propped into any number of positions, and the sled bit allowed it to be shoved by a lone soldier if necessary. The Schlitten 08 also carried spare parts, barrels, seals, oil, etc., all the things you need for the gun. I mean, a lot of stuff came along with the MG-08, and without a sled, well, I guess you had to have like six guys playing with it all. It is a fantastic piece of kit, and we're very lucky to even have one to use because it did not come with this gun that is owned by an individual. So let me cover a couple things. This gun, like I said, Mixmaster, uh, loaned to us by Chris. Thank you so much. We're trying our best to get it tuned back into shape for him. Uh, and it's running fine now, as you can tell, which is a testament to how strong and durable these guns are. Um, he had a Swiss mount, which is not uncommon because it's more available, especially for, you know, sort of a side plate gun like this. And then we borrowed the ZF-12 off of Jeff, who lent us a lock, which we used to get the dimensions for the lock for this one fixed. And then... <laughs> There's so many players in all these guns, and sometimes something like the MG-08, which by the way, I was promised one for loan that sort of fell through like two years ago. And so we already filmed an 0815 long ago, expecting the next month to have this and then run all the machine guns, and then it backpiled and backpiled. So when you guys have something on hand, just let us know, and then the worst case scenario, you get filed in our to-do folder for down the road, but it's really helpful. And the guys who own these things who are willing to loan them and to take them out of sight, that's a huge deal. That's that's the same as giving money or time, it's, it's trust. And we really appreciate that trust that you put in us. Now as part of that, I wanna especially thank the South Carolina uh, Military Museum. So these guys are at the National Guard base over by the stadium in Columbia. If you're in the area, check them out and especially say thanks because what they did is they couldn't lend us the gun that they had on hand, it was missing bits and bobs, but they could lend us the sled and they willingly did it. I went up there, picked it up, they took it out of the case for us, all this sort of stuff. It's a hassle and it's a headache and it's a liability. 
and they just hand it to some weirdos who took it over to Georgia and, you know, played with it with some friends and then filmed a nice history piece. And if you enjoy that level of detail, then say thank you to them and to everybody else that puts in for these things because it's hugely important that we be able to get that help to even get this mission done. We can't buy our way out of all of our problems. We have to borrow for almost all of our episodes. All right, whew. so I covered our thankfulness for the sled and I covered how much we like it and how cool it is. But while we had that Swiss tripod, I might as well talk about that because that thing's actually based off of the commercial DWM 1909 model's tripod. Now, the 1909 was DWM's attempt to compete with Maxim's model 1901, basically an MG08, but with the improved takedown lock and adjustable headspace that this gun sadly lacks. You can spot one of these by the step at the front of the receiver base. The Swiss MG11 is in this family, hence the use of the tripod. These would sell in Brazil, Bulgaria, China, Costa Rica, Mexico, Persia, Peru, Romania, Serbia, and the Ottoman Empire. Belgium also adopted the DWM. WM 1909 as their model 1912 and produced some of their own at Fabrique Nationale just before the war. This is the assembly line that was captured by the Germans. Small curiosity here, by the way, the Belgians actually use dog carts to transport their machine guns. Kind of cool. Anyway, the short story is you will often see some variant of the handy 1909 or its tripod in photos of the Great War with a lot of minor powers. It was a very popular export. Now, I do not have a DWM 1909. It realistically is this gun. They shaved a little bit of weight by coming up on this section. You can see the hump here and it has the better lock. So otherwise it should behave just the same. And since we had what was a 1909 derived tripod, why not run it on this gun and also play with that adjuster, get the fire rate down, let you guys really see some more of the MG08 since this is such a long episode. So let's get it right back over to May. Now it's a little unfair of a comparison on video because we ran the lower fire rate with the lower set tripod. We could have taken that uh, sled mount and really lowered it down, lowered down the firing rate, gotten much better performance out of it. So don't just judge the sort of shakiness of it. Uh, I'm gonna tell you in terms of carrying those things around, that 1909 tripod is a huge pain in the butt compared to just grabbing the sled. Um, the 1909 is like compact enough that one guy can pick it up better than one guy can pick up the sled, but it's still kind of a struggle and it's awkward and you gotta strap things down and you gotta, it's weird and it's dense. The sled, you just go, hey man, grab the other end, I grab the other end. It's designed to fit around your hips. It's designed with little wood blocks to keep from banging them to death. And then you can leave the gun mounted on it and still carry it. Like the, the 1909 mount, trying to carry it with the gun still on it, complete pain in the butt. I love the sled, it's super cool. All right. So today, what have we done? We've covered all the way up to the German 08 and then commercial 09 with the improved lock. That's where we stop though. And normally this is where we kick off to a Mayversation, but I think that this episode is so incredibly long as it is before it starts to become like a two plus hour or whatever. I mean, I'm, we're filming this now. I'm not even sure what this is gonna time out to be. 
uh, and we're basically going to talk about the maxim both times. So we're going to let May off on this one, and we're just going to end it right here, sort of in limbo. We haven't really talked about service life or serviceability, and we haven't talked about the Russian program. So that leaves us all of that for the next episode. And that's going to fit, because we had to go through the whole development history right up to this gun, and then there's basically two models to get into the next episode. And then we can talk very long about how the heck these things were used. And then we can get May's opinion should sort of roughly balance out. So a lot of you tend to watch the first episode of these two-parters. I highly recommend you watch both to get the full picture. And then I am honestly going to turn in for a nap and then we'll start work on the second episode. All right, thank you all. Uh, check after the end music for the updates and uh, we'll see you next time. All right, gang, sorry for the low quality update, but I got a couple things to run down and I figured it's better than just talking into the void. So, uh, number one, please check out Patreon and not just to support. I have a public post, everybody can read it over there, in which I suggest what would be the format for episodes to cover guns that we can't necessarily find to fire yet, uh, in a way that leaves them open to being edited later when we actually do get to fire the gun when we find one. Uh, this would allow us to sort of smooth out production and still cover some of the necessary history uh, as we move through and maybe even bait the guns to coming to us. Uh, number two, uh, we are just about to launch t-shirts. It's a little delayed because I'm waiting on samples and things like that, but uh, again, we're gonna be doing our summer t-shirt campaign. Watch out for a video coming on that in the next couple of days, hopefully. Uh, you guys usually love these things and they go a long way into making sure that we can meet the bills for getting this show done. Um, that and prints at the end of the year tend to sort of float us whatever we're actually able to sort of invest in in terms of equipment upgrades. And I have some ideas after talking to our friend Chad over at IV8888. All right, and then number three, this is more personal, but uh, I haven't had a vacation since the show started. I don't think I've had two days off in a row. Um, and I'm supposed to be due out in Denver, Colorado, so I'm actually considering taking about a week to ride my bike all the way out to Colorado, motorcycle that is. So I haven't done a long distance trip in a good while except for doing it for the show. Um, if you guys know of anything between Charleston and Denver, I'd be passing through St. Louis. Let me know. Um, I just need to put together some sort of itinerary for my own travels and then wish me the best of luck because I haven't done anything over 900 miles, I don't think. And this is a good double. All right, so that's it. Uh, let us know how you feel in the comments and don't worry if you're upset about No May. She'll be back for the next episode with a nice long conversation about the Maxim platform as a whole.